I'm Om Yo Holding Gate Yo. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your practice. Ah, all right, fellow Buddhists. Uh, I want to start off. Hey, Chloe. I want to start off today's uh, talk on uh, continuing on the uh, this book written by our friend Masuharu uh, Anasaki back at the turn of the last century, around the 19th on the life of Nichiren. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It put concepts around Nichiren's doctrine. Uh, and it's a little entertaining, you have to admit. Um, but in, the, uh, in this dialogue, I want to remind us all, this is that time of the year, for whatever reason, you know, it's just another day, another season of the Earth traveling in its elliptical orbit around the sun, solar system, blah, 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 universe, yeah. But on a very small scale, human life on this blue marble in this huge universe, whether it's the holidays, I, I, I forget blame, but the context of transitioning from year to year, which should just be a matter of changing calendars, yeah? This, uh, this time of year, there's an odd kind of introspection that happens. And I think uh, it, it comes somewhat out of our recognition that we're just not individuals or individual as we think we are. And the flip-flop of that and here's what I mean. As Buddhists, you have to understand that your life, my life, his life, her life, we have this verbiage around, this is my life. But, mm, see, this is the conundrum that we face around times like these celebratory times like these because what is the motivation for celebratory times like these uh regathering the family uh friends associates you know whether you call it party together or you call it uh, 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 a meal of uh, togetherness yeah and that togetherness which is really the default state of our humanity. We spend so much time, though, in our attachments to, uh, this is my guitar, this is my car, this is my house, this is not your house. Right? The samsaric disease of me, 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 me. In times of holidays, it gets confronted one way or another. We're all me. All of humanity is me. Your life state. This is how Bodhisattva works. If you hone your self in any way, let alone enlightenment, you change the world around you. And the first thing in the world around you that you affect is the other sentient minds around you. Whether that be mother-daughter, father-son, father, fathers, business associates, neighbors, sisters, brothers. In varying degrees, when you act upon your life, time, 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 time it resonates immediately to all the life around you. It's so hard. You can know that intellectually. I know some of you are really smart. All of you are really smart. Don't mince my words. <laughs> you know, you know the language. You know the the memes, but I'm imploring of you. We live in the time of memetics where we all know the right words. And what does Shakyamuni constantly remind us of about that? 
We've just read a couple of sutras that are almost exclusively about that. It even comes down to, I love you. I love you too. Bye. Talk to you later. Okay. Love you. Do you? More to the point. Do you understand what you're saying? How you are affecting your time to time being when you utter words? Do you have, other than knowing them, a profound a depth of understanding of the commitment, the energy that you're altering when you utter words? Think of it, this is going to be a tough one, but think of it as parent and offspring. Mothers, fathers, when you say to your sons, daughters, I love you. And they say, love you too. How do you feel? Kind of quaint, isn't it? Because you know, without it, now you may be the exception, but you know your 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 daughters, your 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 sons, your cousins, your lovers. But certainly with children, you know they haven't had the life experience to really understand what they're saying. You appreciate it. You like the echo. I love you too. Mm -hmm. But you know that what you feel cellularly when you say to your child, I love you, with it comes all of that. I'm so afraid for you. I want so much for you. I feel so helpless for you. All of that is behind I love you. And when your child goes, yeah, you too, mom. Yeah, you too, dad. I love you too. I love my allowance. I love that. Do they even understand what it is to have a roof over their head yet? Some do. Some do. But you know what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to take apart your relationships. Please don't go there. I'm trying to construct your relationship with yourself and the world around you. Because that's what Buddhism ultimately is about. So that as we chase our full expression of our lives through Buddhaness, we do so not through the words, but through the profound knowing, connection, commitment to life itself. And life isn't exclusive to you. Life is everything that's happening in the entire universe. But certainly, okay, that's too big, Sylvain. Stop talking about the universe. All right. Let's just talk about this blue marble. As big as that seems. Everything, every thought that you and I have imprints, resonates, is felt by, is experienced by everything on this blue marble. Yes, it's a fact. We may not actively think consciously with our tools of perception about every person that's dying all over the world right now because of wars, violence, strife, starvation, what have you. There's a lot of muck in living. But I guarantee you that that little inkling of hope that that person in that situation to Continue is very much connected 
to your determination to help them attain their life. How much more so is that valid for the people around us, for our children, for our parents, for our friends, our lovers, our co-workers, whether you like their behavior or not, your life would be altered without them. It just would. We know this. We know this cellularly. We know this. But with our samsaric minds, we're really good at compartmentalizing, right? And now think as an adult, right? I'm now moving into my late 60s. I've been around for a while. And I've been around for a while long enough to observe that 13-year-old me? Oh, gosh. It's painful, isn't it? 17-year-old me, 25-year-old me, 35-year-old me, 40-year-old me. <sighs> there were times in my life, and I'm sure in yours, and maybe you're there now. Maybe you're just a young person discovering Buddhism and practicing. And I want you to know this, really, really know this. That as a teenager, you're just discovering your place, you, 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 your place within this huge expanse of life. And for you, that huge expanse of life may just be school, the neighborhood, your circle of friends. And your place within it is so tenuous and fragile. And it can seem like, ah, oh, the whole thing is being destroyed. I don't, I'm so lost. Yeah, it's not a happy feeling. I'm not making fun of it. What I want you to please reach out to is, and to know in, in, in the very core of yourself that life is so much larger that right now as a teenager, your life, the way you're experiencing your life is like sticking your toe in the beach without being able to see that huge ocean. Oh, look, water, sand. Wow, this is so amazing. Yes, yes, it is. But with every year as you go along, that body of water is going to get larger. And at sometimes it's going to feel completely overwhelming but know this that body of water that your life that you're experiencing it wouldn't exist without you what yeah it would not be there without you to perceive it to experience it that's the amazing part of life that means that there's nothing overwhelming it's only overwhelming from your perspective. You're just learning how to experience more and more. And it's amazing, I promise you. But with your practice of Buddhism, you'll learn to want more. You'll learn that an opening window of immensity is exalting your life your experience and showing you what you're capable of your potential don't be overwhelmed by it be be amazed by it you could say well that is being overwhelmed but i'm talking about attitude right be embracing of the totality of life rather than buried by it. If we could teach our young people more in this way, it would be far less self-harm, self-doubt. 
right? How many times have you heard yourself as a young person saying, as an old person, I'm tired of being here. I don't want to be here anymore. Because it's overwhelming. Yes, it's huge. But it's all for you. Embrace it. Understand that it's all equanimous. That we're all swimming in the same pool. I speak to teenagers. I'm speaking to all of you. To myself. Because those teenage years are something we all understand and we know. It's a traumatic time. Or young adult, doesn't have to be a teen. Or maybe last year for you. Whatever age you are. It's this grappling with the potential versus the capacity in our lives that we struggle with all the time. And so we're surrounded by distractions that want to narrow that field of experience to what we look like, what we own, where we live. Yeah, that stuff. It's the way we operate in the world of samsara. But it's not you. It's not the, your life. It's just a minor... It's sand through the toes of the beach of your life. And so, you know, if it's the holidays or it's the new year, we're at that place. So this is why I'm talking about it. Go ahead, take the time to review how the year has gone for you. But don't forget to... Pat yourself on the back for all the accomplishments you've made this year. Even if your accomplishments is simply to get through something. You got through it. And you will continue to get through it. Because that's life. Moment to moment perseverance. We're reading about that in Nietzsche right now. The perseverance is the critical component of Nietzsche. And as our mentor, he's demonstrating to us with his own life how perseverance is the critical ingredient to the maximal fulfillment of our potential. And as we enter a new year, as we think about the future, Our attitude should be open armed, wide gaping mouth. I want it all. Because if you really want it all, you will have everything else. You don't have to pull your arms together and battering ram your way through the future. The future is as you bring it in. As you experience it. Don't shy away from experience. It's all there for you. It doesn't exist otherwise. Don't be buried by the past. It's gone. Forget it. The past only affects you now. If you're dragging it along with you. Think about that. The past got you where you are now. From now, go forward. Don't go back to the past and go, Come on, you have to be here. Let it go. That's all. Your tendrils, they're not relevant anymore. Today, be today, be 
into time, the future, radiate out, because you do anyway. This is what we forget in our intense time of individuation. Okay, be an individual bubble, but understand that that bubble is an immense froth. You are never alone. Everything you do affects everything else. And as everything else is affected, it will send back to you what it sees you as, what you look like. It is a reflector. Why is it a reflector? Because you are the one creating it. Live life to the full. Live life to the full. Namo Myoren Gekyo. Happy New Year, huh? <laughs> an interlude and a narrow escape. <laughs> Speaking of struggles. See if we can get any inspiration from Nietzsche's life here. It was in the second month of April in 1263 that Nitrin was released from his banishment in Izu. That was the first banishment, right? The reason for the release is unknown, but his return was a triumph for Nitrin. Right? I made it through. They took him out of his homeland and sent him to some obscure corner, wishing him to die. You ever felt that way? And for whatever reason, they said, okay, you can come back. For Nietzsche, that was like, <laughs> yay, I made it. I'm still alive. And for the people who were learning from him, about the correct practice of Buddhism, they must have thought, oh my, more opportunity to be with this great man, this great person, this wonderful teacher, this understanding mind. It must have been quite a moment, yeah? By the rising of the mob and during his exile, his abode had been devastated. While he was gone, they did, you know, all the people that were motivated by it, he's banished. Yeah, let's go burn his house down. They were emboldened, right? Didn't really affect Nietzsche. But still, he had to come back to that. So his return was at once a great relief and a, a validation of his practice. But he came back to a lot of devastation. But that didn't deter him because, you know, that's just a fallout of stupidity, right? It's just part and parcel. But still, his disciples were ill-treated, right? The people he taught the Lotus Sutra to, the correct understanding of the Lotus, Shakyamuni's teachings of Buddhism and self-enlightenment, some of them some of them were killed some of them were just bullied and beaten up or had their wives or daughters raped right violated and some of his lay followers threatened with confiscation of their properties we'll take all your land you stop practicing or listening to that Nietzschean idiot yeah yet they remained dedicated to the prophet and his instruction. And when the master came back to Kamakura, they flocked to him and welcomed him with tears of joy. I can only imagine. It seemed that some of them wished to see their master mitigate his trenchant attacks upon other Buddhists, believing that the true practice could be propagated without antagonizing others. Please, very selfish, right? 
please uh, let up on your attacks. Don't make any noise. You know, we need you. We want you here. We don't want you to disappear again. We don't want those samurai coming to hurt us. Please just calm down. Keep instructing us. Keep being an example. But, you know, just quietly. And Nietzsche was like, I'm sure he thought to himself, don't you realize that it is that my very mission, the thing that they don't want here, that they exiled me for, that is the courageous action that you, my followers, need to also take a stand? Don't you understand that that's why you value my instruction? Oh, no, 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 Nietzsche, and it's not that. No, calm down, calm down. Just help us understand the Lotus Sutra. Isn't that the kind of challenges you and I face all the time? This is reflected in Nietzsche's strong insistence in an essay written immediately after his return on the proposition that an exclusive devotion to the unique truth of the lotus is the necessary condition for emancipation. He's just repeating the words of Shakyamuni. But he means it. It was impossible for him to modify his attitude. Once you know, you know. If you back off, you become ashamed of what you believe. No way, not doing that. For he was a man who had passed through perils and was thereby strengthened in the conviction of his own mission and destiny. It's obvious now. I have to do this. I have to, to defeat my own doubts. Because he had them. We read about it. There was just too much evidence in his life that the right thing to do was the right thing to do. And he needed to be the torchlight for all of us. This is how you practice correct Buddhism, folks. You don't shy away because some bully comes up and makes fun of you. You have to be smart about it. That's the hardest part. But you must persevere. It's the most important thing. He now preached in a manner more intransigent than before and drew a strong contrast and a sharp line of demarcation between his teachings and those Nimbutsu, those Amida Buddha, Amida Buddha, right? You people, you're, come on, get back on the correct path. You guys are an insult to Buddhism. You, can, you shouldn't even call yourself Buddhist, right? He wrote that in his writings. As well as the Shingon mystics, right? Well, oh, point your fingers. The forcible arguments and vehement invectives directed especially against these two schools exhibit the method of Nietzsche's proselytizing which he now stated explicitly and systematically. He was emboldened. Because basically what Nietzsche, what this writer is telling us and what Nietzsche was telling us is all of these forces, it wasn't the samurai that got rid of me. It wasn't the samurai that said, shut up, stop talking about Buddhism. It was those elites who felt threatened at the power that Nietzsche was emboldening regular people with. Because that's what Shakyamuni's teaching was for. And who were the elites? It wasn't really the head of the, the, the Hojo clan. Yeah, they, you could say they were elites. They were the powerful. The elites, the people who empowered the Hojos by virtue of the way they controlled the populace, it was those damn religious leaders, those posers who said, we'll teach, we'll use the, the traditional teachings of Buddhism but will contort them in a way that endlessly confuses people and puts them in a docile position 
to say, there, there, be good or else. And we'll put that into our teachings and we'll use Buddhism because that's what they're familiar with, the, those stories. But we'll confuse them, we'll lead them astray, we'll disembowel their courage. They'll be good little people making food for us and shoes for us and go to war for us with their very lives. <laughs> yeah. Those are the elites that Nietzsche was identifying. And those were the elites that Nietzsche was trying to change their minds. Because by doing so, he could save the whole nation. But he, as we find throughout his life, he struggled mightily with that, right? Many times he was pushed back to just going door to door. His mission journeys... Irreconcilably pugnacious toward the, his opponents, not the people, the leaders of these faux religions, yet tenderly persuasive toward his followers. See? Nietzsche almost always combined these two sides of his propaganda. But the writings produced within a few years after the exile, that first exile, show decidedly more than the earlier ones, a wonderful combination of the two. So yeah, you could identify them as separate aspects in his Gosho, in his writings. On the one hand, railing against those faux, mixed up teachers, quote unquote, those elites. And at the same time, knowing he was speaking at the same time, not only to those elites, but those he was teaching, his students, you could almost sense him turning from one side to, now students, do you see the nature of what you must resist? This should point out more poignantly how to practice correctly. Never lose sight of that opponent. Because it's not just over there in Kamakura. It's in one's own life. When doubts arise, that's the shogunate in you. You must defeat it at every opportunity. Oh, sorry, it looks like I lost a few frames there. It seems that my video cap capacities meet their limits on this machine when I'm more animated. It's hard for me not to be animated. <laughs> All right, sorry. So you can see Nietzsche being our exemplar. The de delicate sentiment shown in his tender persuasions is now remarkably united with admonitions to honest inward resolve and a pure dedication to the Lotus Sutra, to Shakyamuni's teachings of the Lotus Sutra, to Namu. You see how much those two characters mean? Namu. As we read about Nietzsche, it wasn't just some idle translation of an old Indian term, Namas, or some... Yes, it derived from there. But through Nietzsche, the meaning of Na Mu, ahead of Myoho Renge Kyo, super significant, has a really profound depth of meaning, yes? To be present isn't just to be I. To be present includes everything experienced in life. Mu. That's dedication. Not just I'm here, but I am totally engaged in Myoho Renge Kyo. That's why it's so important to utter both characters when we chant. We see it here, yeah? 
The essay referred to above, written in the form of a catechism, is an example of this. A catechism. Strange word. But the writing he's referring to is about a self-realization, a coming to the fore of a core understanding. That's what he's trying to say. After affirming the necessity of an exclusive devotion to the lotus, it proceeds to emphasize the efficacy of just a simple-hearted, not complicated, just resolve, just know. And so here he's going to quote it. This is from Nichiren. If you desire to attain Buddhaness, your Buddhahood, immediately lay down the banner of pride, cast away the club of resentment, and trust yourselves to the unique truth, unique meaning the one vehicle. Fame and profit are nothing more than vanity of this life. Pride and obstinacy are simply fetters to the coming life. You're dragging the past along with you. When you fall into an abyss and someone has lowered the rope to pull you out, should you hesitate to grasp the rope because you doubt the power of the helper? <sighs> Isn't that what I was opening this discussion with? This is Nichiren. Has not Buddha declared, quote, I alone am the protector and emancipator? The Buddha, Buddha-ness, your Buddha-ness, is the only road to your liberation. There is the power, exclamation point. Is it not taught that resolve is the only entrance to emancipation? We know this. If you're not committed to something, can you have, do you have a right to expect that it will come to fulfillment? When we set our minds, right? This is old rhetoric. When you set your mind to something, do you not achieve something? Even if what you achieve isn't exactly as you perceived it earlier, you have achieved only because you set your mind on achieving. It isn't what you think the goal is that's important. It's your commitment to get there. Because to our great surprise, often when we get there, we are at a place we did not expect. And yet it is a complete expression of, of fulfillment with more than we expected, different than we expected, but it requires our commitment. There is the rope. One who hesitates to seize it and will not utter the sacred truth will never be able to climb the precipice of Bodhi enlightenment. How can you hope to achieve your bodhisattva life, fulfilled life, the maximal expression of your potential as a human sentient mind if you don't reach for Buddhahood? It's not in the rituals. It's not in your hand positions. It's not in your dances. It's not in your rules that you're following. It's in your commitment to enlightenment, to Buddhahood, to Buddhaness. Hmm? Our hearts ache and our sleeves are wet with tears until we see face to face the tender figure of the one who says to us, I am thy father. Is he talking about some religious, mystical experience here? No, he's talking about Buddha. Buddha-ness, when you achieve 
Buddhaness. It changes everything. There's a perception when you chant Namu Myoho Denge Kyo and you invoke with that kind of fervor, that kind of dedication, and you sense it through your body and mind, everything you experience in your life looks different, appears different, involves you differently. You can feel the connection. It breaks down that sense of lonely only to all moment by moment. That's an incredible sensation. At this thought, our hearts beat even as when we behold the brilliant clouds in the evening sky or the pale moonlight of the fast falling night. Should any reason or season be passed without thinking of the compassionate pro promise, quote, constantly I am thinking of you, end quote. Should any month or day be spent without revering the teaching that there is none who cannot attain Buddhahood, devote yourself wholeheartedly to the adoration of the lotus of perfect teaching. Adoration, maybe not the right word. That, that resolve, that commitment. And utter it yourself, as well as admonishing others to do the same. Such is your task in this human life. <sighs> Did not Nichiren just then describe our practice, how we must commit? When you go to your Butsudan, when you stare at that perfect mirror, and you identify the characters Myo and Ho, you're identifying the teaching, the knowledge, the experience that your sentient mind alone can have through that point of entry into your sentient mind, that gohanzan. Experience Buddhaness now, each moment. Namo myoho renge kyo with each daimoku. Boom, boom, boom. Life in its entirety. There is no other way to live. Any other way to live is a compromise. It's a stepping down from that vaulted height to samsara. It's not so much an exhortation to believe as it is an exhortation to be fully. It's a large task. Sometimes difficult to keep in mind. And yet it's the only task to live this life fully. It must not be ignored, however, the writer continues, the author continues, that even this writing contains a sharp argument against the opponents of the lotus. It's implied, isn't it? And with that, we will end this video and we will continue in the next. It is my deeply sincere hope that as we transition, right, calendars as they are, we do this day to day. I really, in, in accord with the teachings, it shouldn't matter that we're having this discussion or I'm talking about this at the end of one calendar year as we move into the next. But as I've said before, it invariably is a focus of a great many people at this time of year. We should always have this focus, though. Could be middle of summer we can have this discussion. But it is probably, you're probably more aware or maybe more aware of this vital lesson at this time. 
So how appropriate is it? How myoho is it that I picked up this book and we started having discussion about Nietzsche's life and we've arrived at this point of Nietzsche's life which addresses exactly what we were going through en masse. Certainly in the Christian world, that's not to say we're Christian, but the cultures and propagations that we live in at least half of the planet is experienced some form of this. And so does the other half. They just shift the dates around. It's the same human experience. Please, again, it is my deepest wish, hope, that this inspires you to redouble, double down on your practice. Have trust in it. Know that you will come out the other side of whatever you're going through. Having a greater, larger, more amazing life. If that's even possible, it's always possible that your life grows in its experience. Thank you. Thank you for your practice, your courage, your effort, because it's all required for you to experience your life to the full and those around you. Your loved ones are experiencing what you're doing. They can't escape it. Have confidence in that. That more than anything, anything else, especially if you're a parent right now, yeah? You know what I mean. Namo myo rengekyo. Like, subscribe, support this endeavor, this resource, this channel, the, 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 the whole thing, the websites, all of it, any way you can. By liking and subscribing, you are supporting this effort, this propagation effort, yeah? If you can, if you can contribute, every cent is valuable. And to those of you who are, I'm so grateful. I don't know how to express it. We all are. It's not just me. This effort thanks you. Please be kind to yourself. Take care of your health. These challenges are just a reminder of just how powerful we are. I'll see you in the next one. Have a great day. Bye for now.